Well, we're going to move on to the second part of our three-part oceanography series. We're going to highlight the layered ocean, and then we're going to talk about our atmospheric and oceanic connection through global winds and global ocean currents. We have to start off by looking at what density is. The, the formula is mass over volume, but really it's referring to how compact matter is versus how dispersed the particles in matter is. The movement convection is when denser materials sink and lighter materials rise. So you get these huge currents that cause wind and water currents. Now, density of water is tied to temperature. Cooler temperature until you hit four degrees centigrade is becoming more dense. So that causes movement and saltier water also is more dense. So when you look at temperature and salinity, we refer to that as thermal, meaning temperature, haline, meaning salt, thermal, haline, circulation. And that's what drives deep ocean currents. So density drives deep ocean currents is also the reason for our global wind patterns. So we have three general layers in the ocean, the surface, which is sunlit, two degrees, it's warmer. The transition, which is that warm, less dense sunlit area moving to the dark, more dense, saltier, lower layer. Uh, that's the transition. And we use the term cline, you know, to incline is to go up, to recline is to go down. Well, we refer to the transition zone as various clines. Now you see the term pycnocline in the parentheses that refers to a density change. There's also a thermocline and a halocline. Remember, halite is mineral salt, so halo, halite. The deep zone consists of about 80% of the volume of the ocean. There's little change throughout that layer for temperature, density. It's fairly rich in oxygen because uh, it generally originates in the surface areas in the Arctic and Antarctic where it sinks. There's not a lot of life using the oxygen up, so these are fairly oxygenated waters. They are also fairly high in nutrients because nutrients dissolve better in cold water. You know, you, you heat things up to dissolve like jello and things and you think everything's like that, but nutrients and gases dissolve better under pressure and nutrients dissolve better cold water. So our deep zone's fairly nutrient rich. That's why upwelling is productive. So here is just a image of our three layers around 200 meters, you have your surface. That's the maximum depth light penetrates. It can vary from region to region and whether there's uh, ice on top or a lot of plankton could, could uh, dull the water or near the poles, it wouldn't penetrate as deep. Toward the equator, it would be a little, little, little more, a uh, little warmer. The pycnocline or that transition zone and then your deep area. This shows the properties, the density. You can see how the density drops drastically during, uh, pardon me, increases drastically during, uh, through the pycnocline. The temperature drops during the pycnocline and the salinity rises during the pycnocline. So the pycnocline is that area of rapid changes. Cline, pycno, thermo, halo. So the surface zone makes up 2% of the ocean, highly variable temperature because seasonality, uh, variable salts because of runoff, evaporation, least pressure, photosynthesis occurs. So most life occurs in the surface, surface area. Sunlight, when there's enough for photosynthesis, we call it photic. When there's not enough for photosynthesis, but there's still light present uh, for 
Eyesight, we call that dysphotic, and then aphotic is zero light whatsoever. Red lights dissipate or are attenuated fastest. Blue light penetrates the deepest. And then you can see here, the equator has the warmest temperatures. The least salt at the equator, or less salt at the equator due to all the rain, and then where the tropics are, Capricorn and Cancer, you have a slightly saltier environment because those are areas that don't receive a lot of rain. That's where deserts occur along those tropic, uh, tropic lines. They have more evaporation, so they're slightly saltier. In the transition zone, about 18% of the ocean, you drop quickly. Salinity also stabilizes to 35 parts per thousand and water pressure gets greater. Organisms that live there tend to be soft bodied or have some flexibility because the pressure increases so greatly. There is a narrow band at about a thousand meters called the Sofar Channel, where sound travels the slowest but perpetuates over great distances because it's reflected downward by the warmer water but reflected upwards by the pressure. So whales, submarines use this area to communicate over hundreds of miles using the Sofar Channel. So the Sofar Zone sound transmission is very efficient and goes for great distances. Now the deep ocean makes up 80% of the sea. It's very cold, four degrees Celsius because of that water density and salinity stable and it's rather salty. And of course, the organism that live there, most of them are bioluminescent in some way, meaning they glow. Here's an image of an anglerfish with its bioluminescent fishing lure. More bioluminescence, pockets of bacteria that glow in the dark or organs that contain chemicals called luciferin that glows. A lot of times it's a bacteria symbiotic, other times it's a chemical reaction in an organ. Here's glow-in-the-dark jellyfish. And of course, Nemo and Dory facing one of the big challenges of the deep. If you thought that was fake, guess again, there it is. So our deep water circulation is because of the thermal haline. It's slow, but water sinks toward the poles and moves across the abyss. We call that movement the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt, and it helps moderate world climate by stabilizing ocean conditions. Now the global air currents are caused by the uneven heating of the earth. They drive our surface currents, so that's why we wedge this in both oceanography and meteorology. They also move our weather patterns. Along the equator, you generally have no wind. Those are called the doldrums. Then you have the trade winds, the westerlies, and the easterlies. Again, driven by the uneven heating of the earth, they do not move in straight paths because the Earth is spinning. That is referred to as Coriolis effect. So they're driven by uneven heating of temperature, steered by Earth's rotation. There's Coriolis himself. He discovered and described the phenomenon. Because of Coriolis's effect, our oceans have what we call gyras, large circular currents on the surface driven by wind. The North Atlantic gyra, which is what we're most interested in, 
comprised of the Gulf Stream, the North Atlantic Current, the Canary Corn, and the North Equatorial Current, encloses an area that we refer to as the Sargasso Sea, named after huge mats of algae that float around in it. This image shows you all of the surface currents on Earth. Red meaning warm waters being moved, blue meaning cold waters being moved. I'd like to direct your attention to the west coast of South America, that Peru current. That's a nutrient-rich current where upwelling occurs near the equator. And that is a very rich fishing grounds. Now, when the trade winds slacken, that current slows down and that water warms up. That is referred to as El Nino. And all of a sudden, the fishing grounds go uh, barren for El Nino years and world climate changes because our ocean conveyor belt and our surface currents are interrupted. I also mentioned the West wind drift, which is the Antarctic so circumpolar current in an earlier lesson. And there it is going around the entire world. You can see the California current, very cold. That's why there's kelp. And of course you can see our Gulf Stream and the loop current looping through the Gulf. The east coast of every continent has a warm current. The west coast of every continent has a cold current that affects the distribution of life. So the major currents in our gyra, the Gulf Stream, which is the highest volume of water movement. When we have spring melt, a cold current develops and pushes down called the Labrador Current. That Labrador Current, because of its push, nor'easters can move down that current. So we do have a cold current opposing our warmer Gulf Stream. And this leads to an area known as the Bermuda Triangle where they merge. And you can see those little swirls of whirlpools occurring. Okay, so that's tumultuous weather. There's a lot of volcanic activity there, very interesting area. Here's Cape Hatteras. So there's the outer banks of the Carolinas, a lot of storms, hurricanes can follow up there. And uh, so this is a very interesting place for oceanography and meteorology. We mentioned the California current again, that leads to productive kelp forests, seals, white sharks, huge ecosystems. It is important that we remember that these surface currents affect weather and climate and moderate Earth's temperature. Now, Ekman spiraling is a little whirlpool caused by winds where water is pumped down. I believe we have a video with small Ekman spirals, but you can go to a bathtub and push your hand and see little swirls come off of it. And I do know that one of our videos displays longshore current, where your prevailing waves erode or push beaches. I'm referring to the extra credit field trip videos, by the way. Currents, which is the return flow from waves. I mentioned upwelling which is nutrient-rich water being pushed from the surface, or to the surface, I should say. It is downwelling, and that's where nutrient-rich water is pushed down below the photic zone, so these are areas of less productivity. And then striping. Debris and plankton form little bands on the ocean surface.